And the judges will introduce themselves. Good morning, Connecticut. My name is Maria Garnett. I live in Richmond, Virginia. This is my third year being involved as a judge with We the People. I'm very jealous of you all for being involved with it as students. I really wish that I would have known about it and could have participated when I was your age. Um, I work in state government as a public policy professional. I am currently serving as a policy advisor for Virginia's Department of Criminal Justice Services. So welcome, it's great to be here with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Wong. I'm a retired attorney and former judge. I'm also on the National Board of Directors uh, for the Center for Civic Education. I currently live in Boise, Idaho. And I'm happy to be here. So please go ahead and introduce yourselves and your coach. Um, but before, before we introduce ourselves, I just wanted, I wanted to make it clear that I, I have a tick disorder, which causes me, me, me to have a mild stutter when I speak. Um, I just wanted to air that out before we started so that you know that that's why I, it might take me a little, a little longer to get words out. That's, thank you. And that's very brave of you to stay right at the beginning. Um, I'm Oliver Clacco, uh, and thank you for doing this. Hello, I'm Ruby Coleman. I'm, I'm Pluto, Pluto Schneering. My name is Jake Fitzpatrick, and this is our teacher, Ms. Scarman. Please uh, tell us the name of your school. Uh, we are from Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut. Great. Well, welcome. I'm going to dive right in and read your question for Unit 6. Thomas Hobbes noted that life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. How has the human condition changed over time? And how is that change reflected in our expectations of government? Should the principles of natural rights or classical republicanism guide policy changes designed to improve the condition of all people? And what are the most pressing domestic and global challenges facing Americans today and in the future? What policies can you suggest to address them? You may begin. The brutality of the English Civil War convinced Thomas Hobbes of the necessity of authoritarian governments, proving to him that as long as man's selfishness endured, there can be no security to any. And so totalitarian power is justified by its ability to counteract these iniquities and provide order. To Hobbes, a good government principally offers protection from life's cruelty. So the only expectation people should have from their government is the protection of their lives. Industrialization, technological advancements, and globalization have improved standards of living, but have made threats facing many, such as climate change and pandemics, more collective and existential. Thus, the world must meet these crises with powerful responses, which are, which are possible through centralized nature of government. The growing prevalence of threats that individuals and small communities are unable to combat has increased expectations of regular involvement from proactive yet publicly accountable governments. Significant improvements in living, living standards have cr created expectations that go gov governments offer comfort in addition to protection. Outlining the, the, sen the sentiment of many framers, John Adams wrote that the end of government ha happiness to the greatest number of persons and in the greatest degree. Significant increases in the markers of living standards, such, such, such as life expectancy, indicate that most people have been sufficiently pr protect, protected from select external threats. Seeing protection is granted, citizens expect their governments to secure, secure happiness, illustrated by the popularity of policies in uni universally increasing education quality, labor rights, and economic equality. These me me measures are not directly necessary for protecting lives from external threats, but are es essential in, in ensuring, ensuring comfort all. Classical republicanism pr provides better avenues to realize these expectations in natural rights philosophy. Natural rights philosophy surrounds the protection of property and rights of individuals, which in modern America is often exploited to legitimize apathetic individualism. In line with classical republicanism, aiming policy towards societal welfare would avoid the individual selfishness of which Hobbes wrote. The framers ensured the enduring protection of the common good by emphasizing the promotion of general welfare in the Constitution's preamble and in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. The General Welfare Clause has since provided the legal basis for funding critical social services. Classical republicanism guides policies that improve the condition of all people, such as transitions to clean energy and the institution of a universal healthcare system. 
Climate change threatens the economic welfare and safety of Americans. The increasing frequency of natural disasters destabilizes markets and damages America's infrastructure, predicted to cause $2 trillion worth of annual damage by 2100. The World Health Organization estimates climate change already contributes to 150,000 deaths globally every year, a number certain to rise. Taking immediate steps to reduce America's carbon footprint, requiring significant sacrifices by the public, would mitigate the effects of climate change. Transitioning to green energy energy through subsidies while withdrawing support for fossil fuels could reduce CO2 emissions by 2 billion tons per year. Banning single-use plastics, mandating a transition to a solely electric auto market, and requiring more energy-efficient construction practices would limit individuals' economic freedom, but would serve the greater good, proving the necessity of exchanging individual liberties for the welfare of society. The American healthcare system's reliance on private insurance leaves 32.8 million Americans without coverage, contributing to a life expectancy ranked 26 in the world. Instituting a universal, a universal healthcare system would remedy America's healthcare crisis. This system would levy higher taxes to provide affordable healthcare to all citizens, exchanging financial freedom for the health of society. Australia has adopted this system, contributing to its life expectancy exceeding America's by four years. Australia's achievement proves that in the, develop, in the developed world, policies guided towards bettering society are more successful than those aimed at upholding individual freedom. Meeting expectations of protection from modern existential threats requires classical Republican approaches, as illustrated by the policies necessary for, for combating climate change and America's healthcare crisis. Thank you. We are ready for questioning. Great. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things you talked about was having more centralized governments is one way to meet a lot of the challenges that have emerged over the past 100 years and into the future. How do we know which level of government is most appropriate for meeting any kind of challenge? And, and can you give me you know, a specific example and also ground that in constitutional theory? Yeah, so um, traditionally we've seen uh, the federal government and state governments and local governments really uh, take and share what problems they face. And while state governments and local governments still have, have a lot of issues to face, um, we've seen that the threats facing people today are, are more collective and they're more existential. So because these threats are so powerful, like nuclear annihilation or climate change, compared to the threats of the past, the threats in 1776 um, and, and earlier on in America, uh, we need really powerful responses. Individuals can't just all take their crack at at avoiding nuclear holocaust. That's not how uh, that's not how solving the issue works. We need our government, our centralized government, with the power that they have in the international community to really help us with those with those issues. Um, furthermore, state governments um, are more responsive to smaller issues, um, as it takes a very long time for things to pass both the House and the Senate. Um, such as specifically this past year, uh, Connecticut has um, addressed the issue of gun violence and gun violence prevention legislation, which then led this summer in the special session to a police reform bill being passed addressing the recent Black Lives Matter mo uh, movements and the recent acts of police brutality. Um, which has yet to be passed. These types of bills have yet to be passed by the federal government. So the state government plays a big role in introducing these policies first. Thank you. So if I heard you correctly in your testimony, you believe that uh, government should enact policies that create happiness for the greater number, uh, secure happiness for the greater number. But what about those for which those policies don't secure happiness and security. Um, what, if anything, can be done to address their needs? Any ideas? So while there are obviously uh, people get happiness from different things, the founders, and as John Adams was writing and Thomas Jefferson agreed, they were really focused on a utilitarian approach where it's the greatest good for the greater number of people. We have 320 plus million people in our country and so we can't make all of them happy um but it's really it's really about sacrifices for the greater good of society as a whole well i understand that i understand that um but as a person who has been subjected to policies that made a lot of more people happy but didn't make me happy what are, so i sacrifice is that what you're telling me is that that's 
that's my life in lot or lot in life is the sacrifice my individual rights is that what i'm hearing um it's it's not as much as a sacrifice of individual rights because that's not a true promise of equality it's that sometimes individual rights have to be sacrificed for the elevation of the common good which then which then can often put um put greater emphasis on those rights later in life as um as things take time our country has been built on a history of racism and discrimination and working towards elevating the common goal um would uh, definitely help redeem ourselves in a way as um it would uh put it it would put um opportunities and redemption back into communities who have been systemically disenfranchised and what's great about representative government is that it includes uh, John Locke's what he thought was a necessity of the right to revolt. So if people are do not think that the government is making them happy, is not securing their comfort, then they can vote in uh, new people in an effective revolution um, that would enact policies that make them happier. Thank you. Can you give me an example of a time the government has tried to ask folks to give up some of their individual liberties for the common good and actually either went too far in doing that and, and how did we know that they went too far um, or uh, give me an example of a time the government didn't go far enough in asking people to do that. Well, there's been a large debate on uh, universal health care in America thus far and asking people to um, give more tax money to help the greater good has been a large uh, debate in the country. And a lot of people don't want to give their money to help uh, more disenfranchised people because they don't see the benefit for themselves. And while this is a, a fair argument, uh, I feel the gov we feel the government hasn't pushed hard enough to protect people who don't have health care and pushing people to really buckle down and pay those taxes for the greater good of America. And with the rise of um, so social security programs and, um, and social programs such as food stamps, we have seen an increase in taxes. But as a result, a uh, 2018 poll said that 45% of Americans believe that their taxes are too high. And even so, we believe that the government should go further, which might create some friction between what the what the um, Amer what Americans want in the moment, and what is better for us going future going forward in the future. So, what do you say to those who advocate for the common good that uh, that that kind of policy approaches socialism? What's your response to that? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I feel like uh, the argument against socialism um, and yeah, it, it's a, it's really just the argument versus classical republicanism or um, or individual rights. But classical republicanism is not really necessarily socialism. It's not only economic. It's really about uh, and, and we've seen many arguments for socialism surround how socialism would make the a utilitarian approach again, making everyone happier economically. Classical republicanism um, is really. Yeah, it, it makes everyone happier. Um, yes. Classical Republicanism argues um, for more, um, in elevating the common good, it argues for more um, civic education and moral education, which uh, we believe um, provides a difference from socialism. So an argument of, you know, having good civic education, does that mean that folks should have to pass a civics test in order to vote? Why or why not? We would say yes, because uh, a, a large reason that um, many uh, voters are so informed um, in modern times is because they lack a federally mandated civic education. Uh, in our town, we're lucky that we have courses like this that are very, um, you know, prevalent in our lives and are very good at teaching us civic education, but not every county, every state, every, you know, town has that. And we think it's really important that um, 
All right, that is time. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your presentation and engagement with us. We're going to give you some feedback now. I really appreciated the way you all pulled in a variety of examples in, excuse me, that's my dog, Lily. She has thoughts as well. Um, I really appreciated the way, for example, you referenced act like ongoing legislation that was happening in your state. Um, that tells me that you're not only studying, you know, the principles and the history, but you're applying it to what you see happening around you today. That's really, really excellent. Um, you know, you guys have a bigger team and it can be a little more challenging to make sure that everybody does you know, participate as much as they can um, with a bigger team. So I just encourage you, you know, if you notice that you have um, stepped in first on a number of questions, or if you feel like you have already spoken more than other members of your team, um, the impulse, I understand, you know, answer the question, just make sure it happens. But, you know, if you've already done that a lot, think about how you could maybe take a step back to create room for your colleagues to do that. Um, but again, you, you all did a great job. I loved <clears throat> hearing your thoughts on this and I wish I could have talked to you about it for hours and hours more. So I hope you all feel really good about how you did today. All right, um, I very much enjoyed your presentation, your testimony during the prepared testimony and the cross-examination questions. And uh, I know I asked you some pretty tough questions, but I think you should feel honored because I only ask tough questions of students when I believe that based on their four minute testimony that they have some thoughts and ideas and, and good answers. And you did have thoughts, good thoughts and good answers. I mean, um, that's how a team shines in this competition. Uh, we expect every team to have very good uh, four minute presentation, but uh, how a team shines is when they're able to answer tough, tough questions on the cross-examination. And I think you did. Uh, and so I congratulate you for that and best wishes as you go forward. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. All right. That concludes this. Thank you. And please enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck. <laughs>